What's going on, church? How are y'all doing? I bid you greetings from Africa, from Botswana, from Zambia. God is moving. He's alive. How y'all doing today? Are y'all feeling good? Make some noise for Jesus one time. Yeah. Wow. I just want to say hello. We love you. Welcome to everybody here, everybody watching online right now. You may be seated. Just look at your neighbor and say, it's about to go down. Just say, it's about to go down. Oh, my gosh. That testimony was so huge. Like, honestly, I could just say good night and we just do an altar call right now. Because that testimony literally is my entire message today. See, I want to read you a quote that I've heard throughout my Christian walk, but it's never felt more real and relevant than right now. And as I got to digging, you know, God and Google are just magical things. You know what I'm saying? I just, like, they, they will take you places. You know what I'm saying? And as I started researching the story and the person behind the quote, God just began to make so much come alive. Are y'all ready for the word? Are y'all ready? Well, God, I thank you right now that you are real, that you are alive, that you have an on-time word for this house and who's ever watching right now. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you stir our hearts, that you create a holy discomfort in our lives right now to get us ready for what you want to do right now in Jesus' name. And everybody says? Yes. See? You got to stir the pot every now and then. When you look in the Bible, agitation was just as much a part of God's journey and design for humanity as anything else. You see many times in scripture where God had to do something to just kind of stir up the waters a little bit because he had to create some movement. He had to get people uncomfortable in order for his ultimate design to be outworked in the world. So today, I'm going to make y'all uncomfortable. Are you ready to go? Anybody ready to say amen? amen? And I just want to tell you guys, being in Botswana, that's what we had to do. How do you reach a nation that's already saved? How do you tell people about the God they already know? How do you share with them a faith supposedly they all believe? See, I love the nation of Botswana. Do you guys know that when the rains came and our aqueduct was filled, the president declared a national church service to worship God, to thank him for the water being full? That's the kind of nation that I'm in, and it's phenomenal. And so you, it's awesome. Come on, celebrate. God is good. Seeing, seeing what's happening at Kingdom City in our, at Zambia. Guys, the interest night had over 40 people back to back both times. It is crazy. I've never seen a, such a crazy, passionate people that are already ready. So what do you do? Like, what do you do when everyone already supposedly knows about God? You've got to shake things up a bit. You've got to reintroduce people to the God they think they already know. And that's what we did. And it's amazing to see. Even today, I've heard so many stories where I'm speaking to parents and they've been brought here by their children. There is nothing more agitating to a parent than when they see a spark in their children that maybe for a season they didn't have. There's nothing more motivating and more powerful when you see your seed giving life back to you. And that is literally how our church has been built in Africa. We were nervous. At first, we felt inadequate, but God gave us a simple, clear word. He said, you reach who you reach. You reach the young people, and I will bring you their parents. And sadly, that was the demographic that was missing in most of the churches, and it happens to be our strongest. And now the parents are coming. Now the grandparents are coming. Now the aunties and uncles want to know what's going on. I mean, it's, I'm telling you, it's a miracle after miracle. But sometimes these miracles happen in uncomfortable environments. Are you ready? Check out this quote. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, 
You use words. And that's actually the title of the message today. When necessary, use words. Today, my job is to agitate this room. We are on the brink as a church of the greatest revival we have ever seen. This is going to be the greatest Easter weekend, Good Friday and Easter that we've ever seen. We're going to see more salvations and more lives changed. And we're going to see God do more in one weekend than we've ever seen in the history of our church. This is not just some prophetic, positive, motivational statement. This is declaring fact in advance. But... It is not going to happen because of fancy production, because of this sick LED screen behind me. This is not actually what's going to do it. It's not going to be the lights and the spoke. It's not going to be a special item. It's not going to be the song selection. It's not going to be an immaculate run sheet. It's not going to be excellent stage design. It's not going to be people that will be here getting ready for pretty much at the crack of dawn, not sleeping, just to present the gospel. It's not going to be any of that, even though all of that is going to happen. But we are going to see an uncommon revival in this house because of a group of people that get uncomfortable to get outside of themselves. And you are going to see God use you to bring the reality of God to your world like you've never seen it before. See, this quote was written by a gentleman named St. Francis of Assisi. If you come from the Catholic faith, this is the patron saint of animals and all things furry and cuddly. Everyone say, aw. Just, just go hug a squirrel when you go home. You know what I mean? It's amazing. But this man is fascinating. And he was so much more than a lover of animals. But he had a faith and a conviction that moves and convicts me to this day. He said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. So I started to study this man and look at some of the stuff I found. St. Francis was a monk and a preacher from Italy. He became wildly known for his extra creative preaching, with sermons being delivered in the open air of piazzas and pastures. He used styles and tactics borrowed from the troubadours of his day, both the romantic prose and foolish frolicking. Doesn't that sound splendid? <laughs> but without rejecting the traditional liturgies of the church. He broke past the norms and conventions of both the church and the culture to preach in ways that caught people's attention. Even when he did preach in churches, he would use living examples and props to bring life to the message. He saw the story of scripture, something to be lived and experienced, not merely commemorated. And the most famous creation of St. Francis of Assisi was the nativity. That's right. This is the man who came up with the idea to build a nativity that demonstrated in physical form the love of God. This was the guy who said, you know what, let's get a real baby and let's build a manger and let's get a Mary and a Joseph and some shepherds and some wise men and some donkeys and animals. let's actually build this thing and set it up in the middle of, this was his idea and it was commissioned by the Pope and it was one of the greatest examples even to this day of the birth of Christ. He was so passionate he even replicated it down to using cow manure just to mimic the smell to show people the humility in which our Savior was born. St. Francis was about that life. You know what I'm saying? So let me break this down for you and let me hit you with a couple other quotes because as you see this man, you, you get more and more convicted and inspired. Here's one of my favorites. He said this, it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Doesn't that just sting a little bit? Like, oh my gosh, like, don't even try to go and preach no sermon if your life don't preach the sermon before you get on the stage. Don't even try to go lead a connect group unless your life leads in connection. Don't even try to go worship lead unless worship leads you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, ladies and gentlemen, do we, like, can we, like, don't even say you are a follower of Christ unless people can see Christ as the one you follow. Everybody just say, oh. You know what I mean? Let me hit you with another one. This one is deep. As for me, I desire this privilege from the Lord 
that never may I have any privilege from man except to do reverence to all and to convert the world by obedience to the holy rule, rather by example than by word. This was a gentleman who understood that the real power was not in what came out of his mouth, but in what was lived in his life. See, today, can we be inspired by his life? Can I agitate you out of comfortable Christianity? Because see, sadly, what can easily happen in a church that is as vibrant and growing and alive as Kingdom City is you can find an excuse to sit back and not make this your personal responsibility and think that Kingdom City is going to do all the work. Oh, this is such a big church lie. Fancy signs, LED screens, so nice, so big, they're everywhere. I don't need to tell nobody about Kingdom City. <laughs> I mean, think about it. With over 25,000 people around the world, eight nations and counting. What's the big deal about me? But ladies and gentlemen, you did not come to a church service today. Today the church walked into a building. And so yes, the church is going to do all the work. When you understand that you are the church, See, I need to get you, are you uncomfortable yet? Okay, I'm not working hard enough. See, let me break it down like this. We live in a world that has heard it all when it comes to religion. There's probably not a single person you know that doesn't have a frame of reference of what church is or some understanding of the Christian faith. Everyone knows about it. It's, you know, it, it, it's disrespected in every movie. It's mentioned commonly in pop culture. Everyone thinks they have this whole thing figured out. But ladies and gentlemen, what message does your life send? When you're with your coworkers, what do people think of God based on your life? When you're at university, young people, what do people think of God when they see how you live? When you are walking down the street, going shopping, as you are looking for sales, are you still looking for souls? I just want to know. See, guys, we've got to understand that it is our job to remember that I am the church. We are the sermon. Your life is the altar call. And sometimes we have gotten so comfortable with the church doing all the work, we forgot that we are it. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you're it. See, we know that the mission statement of Kingdom City is connecting, equipping, and empowering you to bring the reality of God to your world. But let's look at the definition of reality quickly, shall we? Reality defined, according to Google, is the state of things as they actually exist as opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. The state of things as they actually exist as opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. And sadly, when we think of bringing the reality of God to our world, we think of it in very idealistic and notional terms, and we don't actually realize that at some point in our life, our mission statement needs to crash into the state of things as they actually exist. See, I love that story. I love the testimony we just saw because it was a little girl who was just having a Sunday hanging out with her mom. And that was a moment of the state of things as they actually existed. And, they, and, they, and, you know, and it was a Sunday. They could have said, oh, man, we had such a great church service earlier today. Now it's our time. See, I love what Pastor Mark says that this walk of faith is a lot like tennis. If you have the right heart, you will serve and receive at the same time. And see, ladies and gentlemen, I need, I need to challenge your thought that if you think that church is over after the service finishes, and then you feel like you have another kind of life, I sadly present to you the case that that is the notional and idealistic view. But the reality is 
that you are the church, that church does not stop. Just because this service time finishes, Kingdom City goes into your house, it goes into your grocery store, it goes into your job, Kingdom City goes into your shopping mall, Kingdom City goes at your children's school, when you drop off your children, everywhere you go, the service has not actually finished because that should be Kingdom City in service to our world. Somebody talk to me right now. I know that y'all didn't just come to be cute this morning. Like, did you look, because I, guys, I am in a constricting jacket right now, and I do not have full function of my shoulder blades. So if I am going to be uncomfortable standing right here, you will be too. Somebody talk to me this morning, because I know that my God is real. <laughs> Let's look at what the Word of God says. John chapter 10. Verse 37, 38, and this is Jesus speaking. Don't believe me unless I carry out my father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done. Do you realize even Jesus Christ himself said, look, you don't even got to believe the word that I say. But you're going to know it by what I do. Think about it. This is the son of God. Like he can literally speak miracles into existence from his mouth, but even God in flesh put a higher value on actions than words. Even if you don't believe me, but if you do, look at what he says here. By your actions then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. This is based on our actions, ladies and gentlemen. So let me read you another verse. This is a chunk of scripture from James chapter 2, verse 2. Then I'm going to skip to James, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Say two thoughts here. Number one, bringing God's reality to others through action is one of the greatest ways to build your faith personally. See, some of you guys think it's going to be another podcast. It's going to be another sermon. And again, I, I believe it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I believe in the power of devotion. And my life would be nothing if I did not personally spend time with God. So I am the biggest believer in that. But I feel so strongly in this room that some of you today actually came in here, even this week, maybe even this morning, you're feeling like your walk with God has been a little stagnant. Some of you, I, feel, I, I felt it even as, as worship was going on. Some of you, even this morning, morning we're praying God I need my walk with you to come alive uh, God I'm here but I feel like I'm going through the motions a little bit God I'm going to church I'm serving I'm attending I'm doing this I'm doing that but God I just something is I, I don't know what it is but God I'm not feeling something and you've been wrestling with God trying to figure out what's going to make your soul come alive and it's not going to be another devotion it's not going to be another chapter of scripture it's not going to be I know this sounds so sacrilegious but maybe just maybe God is waiting on your faith to get some legs and some hands and actually act out. Some of you guys are so spiritually obese that you actually need to work out your salvation. Oh, dude, was that, was that okay? Was that pretty good, huh? That was pretty good, huh? So I was like, oh, oh dang. <laughs> but think about it. If the body of Christ was a restaurant. You happen to be in a Michelin star organization. And some of us just gorge ourselves one service after the other, one service after the other. Then you go home and fill up on more, and you go listen to some podcasts. Then you have some devotion. Then you do this, then you do that, and then you hang out with a bunch of spiritually fat people just like you. And none of you are actually taking a moment to go outside of maybe your own door and talk to somebody who is actually starving. I got to make you uncomfortable. 
I didn't fly 20 some hours on no plane just to give you no cute little happy clappy world vision sermon. Show you some pictures of some cute little chocolate babies and go home. I didn't come here to do that. We are on the brink of revival, but it is going to happen when every single one of you gets off of your behind and grabs that Easter flyer that you are currently warming up right now, and you take that warm flyer and actually give it to someone to warm their soul, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody talk to me this morning. See, we have got to remember that there is an aspect of your faith that will never come alive until your spirit witnesses action. There, I have cried more and had more God encounters witnessing people that I had the privilege of interacting with encounter God than I have ever had being at an altar on my own by myself. There is something about when you hear someone's story and they say, you know what, I met you here and then God ha- did this and then this thing happened or I spoke to you there and then because of that, th- there is something that breaks my heart even more in those moments than if I just go to the altar just trying to have my own encounter. Some of you have all the counters you need. You need to create some encounters for other people. See, one of my favorite stories is a guy by the name of Tefo from our church. And uh, I met Tefo at the police station. Don't ask what I was doing there. <laughs> but I met Tefo at the station. Actually, I was, I was paying off a speeding fine because I was so busy doing the Lord's work. You know, I just, I was on a chariot of fire asking the Lord for a double portion. <laughs> But as I was there, I just sat next to this guy. I, I wasn't dressed like a minister. I just, I just, you know, normal clothes, just doing my thing, sitting there, waiting to pay this bill. And we just start talking. Just about life. His story, mine. And it was probably 20 minutes into the conversation before what I did even came up. And then when it did come up, he was so shocked because he'd never actually met someone that was of the cloth, that was just a normal person. See, guys, I'm, I'm, not, t- I'm not saying you need to, like, go and, you know, re- empty your closet and just start giving out free jackets to everyone. Look, if the Lord leads you to do that, that's great. But do you know one of the greatest simple things you can do to change someone's perspective of Christians is just actually to have a normal conversation with them? That's, that, that's, that's so countercultural, right? But literally, I mean, some of them expect us just to be Ned Flanders Christians. Like, so like, like people actually expect us to be like, hey, you, they'd come up to us and be like, hey, sir, uh, what's the weather today? Well, the heavens are open today. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, is it raining? Well, it's the rain of revival. You know, is it bright today? Oh, the sun of God is shining upon my soul. Like, some people don't even think we actually have normal conversations. The greatest evangelism you could maybe do is actually show people that we're humans too. But we have forgotten about this because we've created our own Christian bubbles and Christian bookstores and Christian this and Christian that. And it's like sometimes like we create our own little world and then we win Christian awards amongst Christian people and the world looks at that and thinks it's like the Special Olympics. They're like, oh, it's nice. But it's, it's, it's not, I'm, it's not I, they, they can't always connect to it themselves. See, guys, he called us to go out into the world. And some of your faith, some of the passion that you're waiting for is attached to a soul that you have yet to encounter. And I truly believe one of the greatest encounters of your life in this room and everyone watching online is when you encounter someone to God, you are going to see God move through you like never before. See, God is looking for rivers, not dams. See, there's a woman named Jackie. We uh, did the Christmas production over December, and we had a blast, guys. It was so fun. And we're just believing God for transformation and for revival. And one woman who happened to see Kingdom City doing our Christmas nativity show, 
single-handedly from December till now, life saved, transformed. And she personally has brought over 30 people to our church in the last 90 days alone. Guys, it's shocking to see what happens when someone encounters the reality of God outside of a church service. There are some people that are never gonna hear a sermon and that's never gonna be what tips the scale. But it's gonna be you as the church in your world, by the side of a pool, at the grocery store, at the shopping mall, when you fill up your car with fuel, when you get, get to work, you know, in the break room, wherever you happen to do life, there are people that are waiting to encounter God. And it's, I'm not asking you to jump on top of a coffee table, get the biggest wooden Bible you can, and start throwing olive oil on everybody. I'm not saying do that. If God tells you, check with your pastor first. You know what I'm saying? But what I am asking is, how often are you intentionally being in your world? Saying, God, how do I bring you to the state of things as it actually exists? See, and secondly, bringing God's reality to others through action is the only way to share the love of Christ and bypass people's doubts and intellectual reason. Did you realize that? The only way to get through the blockage of the mind is for you to demonstrate it and for them to see it. I mean, look at doubting Thomas in the word of God. Do you realize it wasn't the resurrection that made Thomas believe? Do you realize it was not even Jesus appearing through a wall that made Thomas believe? It was not even Jesus standing in front of Thomas saying, hey, I'm alive, dude, that made him believe. But it was Thomas seeing the scars in his hands, seeing and feeling the hole in his side. It was not until Thomas experienced the reality the state of things as they actually existed and God influencing his reality, that is when he believed. Can you imagine that? Thomas would have long heard, Jesus is alive. Everyone would have been hearing reports. The word of God tells that Jesus had been appearing to people for a month. Everyone would have heard a story about a dead guy coming back to life. And some of us are saying, hey, Jesus is alive. And we have Thomases in the world that are like, yeah, I don't care. But some people need to feel the holes in your hands. Some people need to feel the hole in your side. See, that's why Jesus left the scars. Think about it. Jesus could have come back to life in a perfectly squeaky clean body. If he can raise people from the dead, cosmetic surgery was not above his pay grade. <laughs> but Jesus made a choice to leave the reality on his body. And that is what caused Thomas to believe. And my question is, how many Thomases are in your world? See, two of the greatest ways your life can speak is through integrity and compassion in this season. A lack of integrity and a lack of compassion have been the two loudest actions that have helped shape the way our current society sees the church and Christians. Think about it. You personally, and everyone you probably know, knows of some church or pastor with a lack of integrity and the collateral damage and the fallout that has happened because of that. Or, Everyone knows of a church that has shown a lack of compassion and shown callous indifference, even sometimes bigotry and hatred in the name of God. And people have seen that. Ah, look at that church. Look at that. I want nothing to do with that. But ladies and gentlemen, I wager to you today that if we can simply focus on being a church of integrity and a church of compassion, that we live upright, that what we actually live is what we say. What we do is who we are. 
are, that our yeses are yeses, that our noes are noes. And if we can walk through our world with a broken heart for the lost, I promise you, we will see a revival like we've never seen before. When was the last time you were moved emotionally? Walking through your neighborhood for those that don't know Jesus. When was the last time you were physically bothered driving down your street on the way home at the possibility of those within walking distance from you that might die and never experience the love you know? When was the last time you were physically affected walking into a classroom and seeing so many students that their head is full but their hearts are empty? When was the last time you went to the grocery store and it bothered you how many people are looking for sales and looking for deals, trying to fill their stomachs but they can never fill their spirit? Ladies and gentlemen, when was the last time it bothered you? When was the last time your heart was moved with compassion? How many stories do we have in the Bible where Jesus didn't even plan to do a miracle but the Word of God says he was moved with compassion? passion and therefore a miracle happened. How many times has we seen our Savior and our Lord do it for us, so why can't we do it for other people? Yeah. See, guys, we, we become so calloused. We become so apathetic because we think this is just such a great, well-oiled machine that surely Kingdom City doesn't need our help. But ladies and gentlemen, I need you to take your rightful place as the hands and feet of Jesus. I need this. I need for us to not even have enough room on a Sunday to play testimony after testimony and story after story of people bringing the reality of God to their world because we all went out of our way to take a little piece of paper and show the love of God to someone or just to be kind to someone or just to show grace to someone or to show love to someone. When was the last time? See, guys, I'm alive, not because of a church service but I am alive because of people that showed me what God looked like. Because I grew up in a world where I thought I knew everything about God. I was born on the front pew of a church. They cut the umbilical cord, put on an itchy suit, spanked my behind, and I was in a four hour church service. I didn't have a choice. I thought I knew everything there was to know about God, only to realize I had no idea who he was once I saw him demonstrated through someone's life for real. People are waiting on you. This is why I love Matthew 5, 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Nothing's changed, guys. Actions speak louder than words. I'll pray for you as a great start, but I'll walk with you as a great finish.